had a dream to be an exchange student in Canada. And now, it's possible to make this dream come true. Meu nome é Alvir, e com a Wizard, eu conquistei meu certificado internacional. E cheguei lá. O Alvir e outros milhares de brasileiros já aprenderam a falar inglês para realizar sonhos. Agora é a sua vez. Venha também para a nação da maior rede de idiomas do mundo. Obrigado, Wizard, por me ensinar inglês e me fazer chegar lá. Wizard, por uma nação bilingüe. Olá, um, hello everyone. My name is uh, Guy Vardy. I'm a co-founder of an Israeli startup called Matific that deal with uh, math education. Before uh, starting Matific, I was uh, a founder of a casual games company. So my background is completely opposite from the guy before me. He was a teacher, moved to gaming. I uh, started as a gaming, moved to education. But the uh, accomplishment that I'm most proud of, I'm the inventor of the of the world's first mobile uh, toilet, and I have an opportunity to show it on stage. Um, the presentation is going to be in English. I, in Portuguese, I know only how to say hola and charascaria. So uh, unless you want me to hear me saying charascaria for uh, 45 minutes, I, it will be in English. So what I'm going uh, to talk about today is about the relationship between human technology and the future of education. And technology is a very broad uh, definition. And different people define it in a different way. I like the definition of Ellen Key that defined technology as anything that was invented before you were born. Sorry, after you were born. So everyone know that just as technology has revolutionized other industry, it has the power to transform education. That's incredible. Think about Uber, think about Facebook, think about Google. Oh my God. Um, however, it's not really a, a new idea. In uh, 1905, in a, an exhibition in Paris about how the future is going to look like in year 2000, an artist presents this machine. All you need to do is to connect the kid to a piece of technology, and by the end of the process, he will be an expert. In the 30s, when record players were available and uh, someone came with a brilliant idea, all we need to do is to connect the kids to this amazing technology, and they are going to become an expert. Um, public radio, all we need to do is to connect the kids to this amazing technology, and they are going to become an expert. Um, These young people are studying this is a, the Skinner teaching machine in the 50s, it might as well very be similar uh, idea. We connect grammar, kids to the technology and they are become experts. Personal computers in the 60s, personal computers in the 80s, uh, current uh, personal computers. And if you don't believe me that you can connect a kid to a device and he's going to be an expert, please watch this movie. Can you fly that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. And if you don't believe this documentary, I highly recommend uh, watching it, The Matrix. So what is uh, common to all this technology? It's a very simple idea. Let's use technology as a distribution channel. There is a very strong assumption that knowledge is an object, can be transferred from one place to the other, like any other commodity. If we look on a typical supply chain, it's very similar. All we need to do, we are eliminating the middle name. Without the middle man in between, we achieve scalability. We reduce the cost, we increase the quality, we increase the speed, we increase the results. Amazing. But before I jump ahead of myself, let's do a quick sanity check. What will happen if we take away technology from businesses like Uber. It's gone. 
what will happen if we take technology from businesses like Amazon? It's gone. What's happened if we're taking technology from a bank like Safra? It's gone. So what will happen if we take away all the technology from schools? No computer, no smart board, no cell phone. What will happen? Nothing. Ah, um, so we have a problem here. There is a gap between this amazing uh, vision to what happened in reality. And the reason for this gap is very simple. We are trying to solve the wrong problem. It's not about moving uh, data or information from one place to the other. It's about learning and about what schools are good for. So our basic assumption that technology is an object that can be moved from one place to the other, it's wrong. Knowledge is not a commodity, and learning is not a process of transmitting and receiving information. Learning is an active process. Let me show you a quick uh, graph. This is a research done by MIT. They connect electrodes to students for 24 hours a day, for seven days a week, and check the brain activity during different activities. As you can see, when you are uh, sitting in a class and listening to a lecture, like this lecture, by the way, um, the brain activity is almost zero. It's the same as watching Bebebe Be Be on the TV, which means that it's not really effective way of uh, stimulating the mind. On the other end, if you look on lab or study or uh, research, there is a high level of uh, brain activity. Um, another funny element from this graph is the fact that the highest brain activity happens while we sleep, which raises an interesting question, what will happen if a student is going to sleep in the class? Um, but again, learning is an active uh, process, and the goal of a successful education uh, system and a successful education technology is stimulate this action process. Let me give you a very simple example. Everyone in Brazil played Ruko. In Israel, no one played Ruko. So I came to Sao Paulo two days ago and say I heard about this amazing uh, game. Please teach me to, to play Ruko. And they start explaining to me that there is cards and you can cheat, but not always. And it's like poker. And it's not really like poker. And I got completely confused. At the end of the day, they told me, guy, why don't you just start playing? You will grasp it yourself. You understand what uh, is going on. And that's a very good example for an active learning. I can participate in the world best seminar about how to play Truco. I would not know it until I'm going to try it myself. So when we're talking about technology, it's not about how we can deliver information. It's not about how to deliver knowledge. It's about how to promote a meaningful thought process. Um, Jean Piaget, which is the father of modern psychology, summarized uh, a lot of researchers with very nice uh, phrase. To understand is to discover. If we want the kids to really understand the concept, they need to reconstruct it themselves. If they can, they can discover it. If not, they are going to do a mental processing of understanding the information in their own, uh, in their own mean. Uh, and again, think about uh, yourself. You create analogies, you try different uh, things, and so forth. And technology is a great, great playground for that, because invention is really tough. Invention on a computer, it's really easy. Let me show you a couple of uh, examples. This is a, a device. It costs about 100 uh, US uh, dollar, about 400 uh, real. It's full of sensor, anything from uh, temperature, attitude, volume, distance. A couple of years ago, equipment like that will cost 10,000 of dollars. Now it's very affordable and very durable. And they just give it to class students to perform experiments. And different teachers taking it into different ideas. Um, in this case, it's a school in Russia. They calculate the volume of the class to try to measure how many students can fit in. Another uh, teacher in the UK connect this device to a, a weather balloon and took the device to space in order to check pressure in different levels of the atmosphere. 
And imagine, an elementary school teacher can actually facilitate a research done by six, seven, eight, nine years old uh, kid using this uh, technology. So a kid that launch a weather balloon with a device, I'm sure will understand much better about the atmosphere comparing to a student that just learned it in the textbook. Another example, a teacher in the US asked the kids to rewrite Romeo and Juliet in Twitter. So just think about how it's possible to take Shakespeare into modern day language with 140 character. What does it require mentally? You really need to understand the play. You really need to understand the character. You really need to understand the motives of the characters. You really understand the, the motives of the different characters and how the plot uh, evolve. So in this case, coming back to Piaget, the students actually reinvent using modern technology a Shakespearean play. This is actually one of my favorite uh, examples. There is a US organization called FIRST. They promote science and engineering in uh, high schools. Every year, they are running a competition between different schools. And the goal is to build a robot that will be able to compete in a different sports game. There are, I think, about four or five uh, Brazilian schools that participate every year. But think about it, a 16, 17 years old uh, kid building robots. So suddenly, physics becomes something very meaningful. It's no longer an, an equation. It's something that is going to make you successful or fail. Linear algebra from a very theoretical uh, element is going to be the tool that you're going to decide how strong you should uh, throw the ball. Um, the theoretical science and engineering suddenly become very, very practical. The next one is a, an example run by one of my uh, colleagues at uh, Matific. And in this case, we teach four grades geometry, but we don't let them know anything about uh, geometry before they start. Instead, we present a set of tools that encourage them to discover different uh, geometry uh, attributes. When you deal with a concept like area, uh, well, we also provide a set of tools that the child is invited to experiment with in order to learn. So uh, if area is what interests us, then one thing which is natural to do is to tile the area of this particular shape and simply count how many tiles it takes to cover it completely. And this little exercise here gives you a first uh, a sort of good insight of the notion of area. Moving along, what about the area of this figure? Well, if you try to tile it, it doesn't work too well, does it? So instead, you can experiment with these different tools here by some process of guided trial and error. And at some point, you will discover that one thing that you can do among several legitimate transformations is the following one. You can cut the figure, you can rearrange the parts, you can glue them, and then proceed to tile just like we did before. So I guarantee to you that any kid that discover that immediately will remember for life what is the, how, what's the formula to calculate the area of a parallelogram. It's multiply the height with the width. And I can guarantee you that most of you wouldn't know that before that video. Because you learn it as yet another equation on the screen. Another nice thing about this uh, little demo it's also let the kids discover the concept of reduction. If you have a very complex mathematical problem and you don't know how to solve it, try to shift it to a simple mathematical problem that you already know how to shift. And you have this insight as a student at fourth grade. One of my favorite uh, quotes from uh, Professor Shoken is the following. We obsess with grades because we obsess with data, but grading takes away from fun of failing. And failure is something very important, specifically for learning. And tolerate failing is really essential if you want to get better in what you are uh, doing. 
but schools are not very tolerant for failures. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. When a... Uh... Michael Jordan was selected to be part of the NBA Hall of Fame. His entire speech was dedicated to his high school coach. And the reason that he dedicated the speech to his high school coach, because at his junior year at high school, the coach didn't select him to the basketball team. And that level of failure was the critical part of Michael Jordan life in order to overcome that failure and try again. But of, most of us are not Michael Jordan. Most of us, if we're going, going to fail, some of us are going to try again. Some of us are not going to try again. Let's show another example. This is airship number 14 of Alberto San Dumont. And it was a disaster. It was a failure. It completely crashed. If he would be a student in any school that I'm familiar with, the teacher is going to give him an F minus, going to write a letter to the parents with a wrong recommendation that maybe aviation is not a career for little Alberto. Instead, they recommend moving back to the coffee business. But the nice uh, thing about uh, Alberto Santon Dumont, he was very systematic in in his ability to tolerate failure. He conduct a series of experiments, knowing that experiment can fail in a very organized way. The airship number 14 is significant because this is, was the last time that he tried to combine a balloon with a machine that is uh, heavier than uh, air. And obviously, it's failed. So he continued with the approach of, let's forget about the balloon and focus on the airplane. Imagine for a second. What will happen if he wouldn't fail? If this, this functional machine will be able to fly, let's say, five seconds, he will be very happy, and the Wright brother will be known for uh, winning the aviation uh, battle because he wouldn't try different approach. But Alberto Sandomant was strong enough character and good enough engineer in order to overcome the, the failure. Unfortunately, School culture doesn't work like that. Schools, it's all about uh, grades. It's all about whether you're successful in the, is, uh, in the test or not. The idea that to be successful is great, but to fail is even better, is not very tolerant in uh, school. This is a research. It's a survey done at, uh, with American teenagers. And they ask them, what is your worst fear? And you can see some kids are afraid of audition. Some kids are afraid of bullying at school. Some kids are afraid to talk to their parents or, to, or talk to their uh, teachers. But 75% of the kids are afraid of bad grades. 75% of the kids are afraid not to do good at schools. Now, show me again the Michael Jordan and uh, the aviation example and explain to me why a failure is uh, important. We are sending double message to the kids. And if grades is important, they will worry about the, the grades. On the other end, when we play computer games, we fail by design. If you then fail in the computer games, it's not a fun game, it's boring. And sometimes, failing in a computer game is very traumatic. For instance, in this case, it's an Oregon uh, Trail. You have died of dysentery. Because everyone is out after lunch, I'm not going to get into details. But to me, it sounds way more traumatic to die out of dysentery rather than getting an F- in school. But this is not the case, because video games is a very tolerant environment for a uh, failure. This is a series of uh, portraits taken by a British artist 
of computer gamers uh, while they play and try to understand their facial expression. We can see anger, we can see joy, we can see surprise, we can see wondering. We, oops, we don't see a, a sense of a failure. No one thinks that he is a loser because he fell in a computer game. On the other end, try to teach a, a kid that got F in math the next semester. The self-esteem of the kid is going to be so low that as a teacher or a parent, your ability to tell him, don't worry, it's just a test, let's try again, is not there. Several uh, companies around the, the globe try to adopt that concept and transform areas that you study in school into more computer-like. Couple of examples. This is a... This is a video game. You play the character of the monkey. You need to collect uh, bananas. The nice thing about the game, you can control the monkey by writing coffee script. So a byproduct of the gameplay, you actually learn how to program. And if you're doing it, you're going to win the game. And if you're going to fail, nothing happened. It's just a computer game. This is a, a game done by a company named BrainPop. And here you are building a human body. So instead of asking the kids to operate a frog, they ask the kids to build a human being and place the different organs of the human body in the right order. And again, no pressure. You are just uh, playing a, a video game. They adopt the nation of learning uh, by doing in a, an extreme uh, way. Jumping to the next example, music education. The challenge with music is if you're making a mistake, there is really a nasty way of the system to let you know. It sounds horrible. And that's make a lot of uh, kids um, afraid. What this company Joytunes is doing, they are taking the mechanics of guitar hero or rock band into practicing playing a piano. So the pressure is gone. All you need to do is to be good as a computer game. The byproduct you are going to learn to play a piano. The goal of the game is to sink the ball in the basket. This can be done by carefully placing springs in various locations, building a path that will end up bringing the ball to the destination. In the process, children learn how to combine addition and subtraction, how to move back and forth on the number line, and how to do step counting. And like many motific episodes, the child is free to decide how he or she wants to solve the problem. Different children come up with different solutions, and that is just fine. Indeed, a key element of the motific pedagogy is that children should control the scene actively and individually. So think about this uh, small episode. Instead of trying to explain to the kids, imagine that you have this infinite line, and it's starting from here, and it's going all the way to here, but it's not a real line, there are numbers, you just let him uh, play the game and explore this notion himself. And if he's failing, nothing bad is happening. The nice thing about all the examples that I've shown, they collect tons of data. But it's not in a form of test. This data is a byproduct of the process, not the goal by itself. 
And there is a nice quote from Lor Kelvin, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So the justification to a test in the school, we need to measure the performance of the kids, therefore we, know, we need to know how to let them improve. So a typical improvement uh, cycle is going to be like that. We plan what we want to teach, we teach, then we run a test based on the results of the test we improve and then we plan again and again and again. But there is one but. It's done once a year. Pretty much around the April in Brazil, no one is teaching anything in school. Instead, you are starting to get ready for the final exam. Because if the kids are going to do well in the final exam, the teacher is going to do well in his evaluation. If the teacher, if the student is not going to do well in the final exam, the teacher is not going to do well in his evaluation. So there is no improvement. Instead, what we are uh, using grades is as a show off. In uh, evolution biology, there is a concept of handicap principle. It's explanation why a peacock has such a wonderful tail. The reason, it's just the weight. It's a luxury good. And he wants to show that if he can afford allocating energy to grow his tail, he's a very strong peacock. That's exactly what we are using uh, grades for. We want to say Guy is better than Dennis and Anna is better than Guy. It has nothing to do with improvement. It has nothing to do with uh, how we can uh, teach uh, better. Now, let's have a, a radical uh, thought. Grade should be byproduct of the learning process, not the final process. And technology, because it's transparent, because it's behind the scene, can help us do it in a very effective way. So think about this improvement uh, cycle. And instead of running it once a year, let's run it once a minute. And we don't need to have a test, right? The system collects all the data automatically. Immediately, we are going to be very effective with our improvement cycle. Now. Let's think that we don't have a one improvement cycle. We have one improvement cycle per student. So my performance, I am bad at arithmetics. I need to work on my fractions. That's going to be my improvement uh, cycle. Other person are, are bad in speed counting. It's going to have a different improvement cycle. So suddenly, we are shifting the focus from the outcome, the grade, to the process of learning which make totally sense because schools are not factories. In a factory, the product is the important part. In school, the learning process is the important uh, element. And a teacher has a critical role in facilitating this process. If we don't worry that much about the outcome, about the product, about the grade, someone needs to coach the student. So instead of being a saint on the stage, the teacher suddenly become a coach on the side that help you through the improvement uh, process. This is a very nice quote from an Australian uh, doctor called Dirk Muller. And Dr. Muller says that the job it, of the teacher is to inspire, to challenge, to excite their student to want to learn. And then and you have a terrific uh, YouTube uh, video that I strongly recommend you to watch. The, nice thing about it, he look at learning as a social uh, process. And we are social animals. Another uh, research, um, this is a research that was done in 2012. They asked kids to take the shapes um, on the side and combine them to a sailing boat and a, and a fish. And they used two forms of uh, instruction. One, there was a teacher Re um, reading a script, and the other one, the exact same script was um, recorded and played on a video. And there is a significant performance uh, between kids who watch the instruction live versus kids that uh, uh, watch this exact same instruction on a video stream. And the reason for that is very simple. We are social animals. Our brain is facilitated to be very good at human interaction. And with all the respect to technology, we cannot replace the human interaction. As we saw before, we can do wonderful things with technology, but the human interaction process is critical. So if 
anyone here is afraid that teacher jobs are going to to be eliminated this is not uh, the case we can see that some aspects of teaching homework assignment uh, checking grades checking tests are going to be automated about 20 percent of the task but the essence of of a uh, teaching facilitated the learning process cannot be replaced by a machine if you are by the way a Liberian half of your work can be automated because most of your work is dealing with data not with people most of the work of a, a teacher is do, is dealing with people so the next thing that I want to talk about is where the medium is going where uh, all this school system is evolving so we talk a little bit about jobs of teachers now let's talk about jobs in general this is a research was done at the uh, Oxford University that predict the future of jobs where the job market is going and it's small letters but you can see that the uh, jobs as a uh, farming or delivery or drivers there is almost a hundred percent chance that they are not going uh, to stay on the other end job that require creativity analytical thinking are going uh, to stay so if we want to teach kids to the jobs that are going to stay what skills does the kid uh, need uh, to have and that's going to change schools right so we are talking about five areas the first one is communication the ability to express yourself to have a conversation the other one collaboration how to work in a team how to collaborate with others the next one is critical thinking and problem solving and the next one is a is a learning and learning is extremely important right now the pace of uh, knowledge that we are producing as a humankind multiple multiply itself in the factor of 10 every five years it's mean that half of the scientific knowledge that we have become obsolete within 45 years so think about it half of the scientific knowledge become obsolete within 45 years think about it next time that you go to the doctor and ask him when did he graduate so a doctor that graduated 40 years ago probably has nothing to do with anything that modern science is telling him about unless you have the skill of learning so it's shifting completely the process of learning till 10 years ago learning was something that you do in school now learning is something that you need to do yourself so let's look on how the existing technology is being used in school Wikipedia if you are teaching the kids how to access information it's public enemy number one on the other end if you are teaching the kids how to decide what is important what is less important how to prioritize how to assess information how to collaborate and work in the team Wikipedia become really important same thing with the calculator if you teach longer division because it's a practical way to to uh, divide two big numbers you miss the mark in about 50 years if you want to teach problem solving calculator is very handy um, what's up today if two kids are going to chat in the class it's considered to be cheating you are going to be expelled from a uh, school on the other end everyone here is going to be fired if he's not going to collaborate with his peers so these tools are not going to go away we need to make sure that they are going to adapt to the needs but this is a very natural process when a medium is being uh, born typically it's being used in a very traditional uh, ways couple of examples this is a, a screenshot from the first TV drama and because I want uh, this talk to be engaged I didn't include the seven minutes uh, video but it's a really boring video of four people standing in front of a microphone and reading a script because it's completely adaption from the radio the previous medium because TV it's a visual medium they're wearing a suit and a tie more a recent example the first version of Amazon it was a mail order catalog the big feature was editor recommendation change every day now think about technology in schools in many many cases, what we are uh, seeing is pure adoption of textbooks ignoring 
how to teach to collaborate, how to teach to fail, how to do an active uh, learning. And let me try to run a quick demo here. Okay, we are going to do that with uh, an audience uh, participation. I ask your help to determine whether it's a uh, odd or even. So to count on three, please shout if you think it's odd or even. One, two, three. Louder, I can't hear. One, two, three. Even. even. Good. Next one. Odd or even? Odd or even? Okay, there are three groups in the audience, those who know how to count and those who doesn't know how to count. Okay, don't worry much about that. So here, it's a little bit more complex, but I can move the beards around. And now I can see that I can pair the beards. So, ah, so that doesn't have a pair, therefore that's going to be an odd. An arrowhead formation. Let's do the same uh, pairing trick. Okay, I can see that the formation of an arrowhead is always going to be odd. Very nice. And I'm going to move birds again. Okay, that's a tricky one. So we add a, an odd group of birds and an odd group of birds. But I can move this bird here. And I just discover that um, an even number, sorry, an odd number and an odd number resulting with an even number. Now, coming back to the confusing uh, arrowhead formation. So we learned two important principles that an arrowhead is always going to be odd, and odd and odd are going always to be even. Therefore, it's even. The same principle, moving back to my horror uh, days at school, can be expressed using this uh, uh, proof. And it's really important. But I bet you that if you ask a kid to play this little game, his level of understanding and intuition of odd and even is going to go through his academic career when he's going to uh, uh, learn a, a set theory at the university and the professor is going to ask him, can you compare two infinite number and whether it's possible that there are more fraction than whole numbers, he immediately will know how to do that because he learned the concept of, mathing, of mapping hands-on when he was in second grade. So just to conclude, when we are looking on with what this new medium look like, we're talking about five elements. It needs to be modular, it needs to be constructive, it needs to be collaborative, adaptive, and engaging. Jumping back to the, Oxford, uh, to the Oxford study, we can see that there is a strong relation between the academic uh, education and your ability to make a living in the future. If you are not uh, educated, your chances of uh, being unemployed are, uh, are greater comparing to an to a educated person. And this is critical because if till these days you can still make a, a nice living working as a car manufacturer a factory or a, at a coffee farm or raising cattle, these days are gone. You are not being going to be able to make a living. And unfortunately, that starts based on the US, but the numbers in Brazil are quite similar. There is a strong correlation between how uh, wealthy is the, is the family to how good 
the quality of education of the kids. In other words, poor kids are going to poor schools. Rich kids are going to rich uh, schools. And technology is not going to make it better. Technology actually can make it worse because if you have a low income job, you will have limited access to technology. You are going to end up with lack of skills that is going to move you to a long uh, income jobs. So when we think about technology, it's not, also, it's not only how we should use technology in the class. It's also how we can make sure that everyone in the country have equal access to technology. Because without access to technology and education, their future is not that uh, bright. In Brazil, there are several uh, non-profits that already take that as a mission. The Lemon Foundation, Unibes, and others already take it in, uh, in, in consideration. And this is really important because the combination of big data, affordable device, and connectivity can improve dramatically the quality of education. But if we are not going to make sure that it's going to be accessible to all, it's going to improve the quality of education of some and going to make others more poor than are today. So with great power comes great responsibility. And when we think about technology in school, we need to think about that. Thank you so much. So if uh, anyone wants to ask uh, any question, one second, let me put the, it's going to be in English or? Okay, so. Is there a microphone by any chance? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the lecture. It was very, very interesting. But here, uh, at least here in Brazil, uh, I see a problem in my college and in other uh, educational institutes that people are afraid of getting into uh, new fields of knowledge. Like, for example, I'm graduating at biology and people that are afraid of math mathematics because they have some traumas in the past in high school or elementary school. Do you think that, that everything that you spoke here is going to help people that are not uh, are in higher levels of edu education? Yes, the principles are the same. What we are seeing is that there is a shift between the outcome to the foundation. And let's take uh, the trauma that you mentioned, that people are afraid of math. What's happening in a lot of cases, elementary school teachers is the most uh, difficult job in the world. Why it's so difficult? It's the Swiss army knife, uh, sorry, it's the Swiss army knife of teaching. They need to be expert in math, in teaching, in history, in geography, in everything. Unfortunately, no one can be an expert in everything. As a consequence, in math specifically, they tend to teach tips and tricks rather than the foundations. And companies like uh, my company, but other companies as well, trying to develop a technology that is going to empower teachers, that's going to help teachers teach the foundations. And that level of philosophy is also applicable for a uh, higher uh, education later on. Focus on the foundation, not necessarily on the applicable results. Uh, thank you for your very good presentation now and uh, very crystal clear uh, and uh, I want to ask you about uh, you, s you show us that uh, it's very uh, it's very easy to uh, apply your concepts to, exp to, to teach math to, che to teach other things in the well, other uh, classes but uh, do you believe that the same method that you have could be applied to teach moral and ethics for the uh, because it's not so uh, straightforward as uh, to teach math and so uh, do I'm, you think that I'm not sure that I understand what uh, subject or field are you uh, uh, if the same method that you are yes. working on Matifki is, yes. is up, could be applied to teach uh, known 
straightforward things like math, but like uh, ethics, like moral? How, how, how? Yes. So, first is a perfect example of that. First, it's a teamwork, and if you and engineering is just a playground, and if you are going to be a, in a startup a culture, it's called the asshole developer. If you're going to have an ass and the rule is don't deploy them because they're going to ruin the company. So if you have an asshole developer in your uh, robotic team, the team is going to fail. So just because you want to be successful, you need to collaborate. You need to evaluate different roles. It's the first time in your, your life you say, okay, I'm not that good at uh, engineering. I'm better good on designing the, the marketing effect around that. Let me focus on that. So suddenly there is a dialogue about skills and about collaboration. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I am a teacher myself and as experimenting with my students, I'd like to say that I extremely agree with your presentation and things, but I'd like to ask you, do you have any source of games and any other types of um, those methods you showed us, do you have any source, any sites or anything that could be so used? In the US, I would recommend to going to a site called Graphite, Graphite. By, a comp by a non-profit called Open uh, Graphite. I don't remember but the name of the foundation. It's called graphite.org. And it's a huge repository of, uh, of uh, digital resources. They're taking the same approach. It's called Common Sense Media. That's the nonprofit that they uh, run it. Uh, but do you have, in, in this source, you have only things for math, physics, or no, any, any? Everything. OK, thank you. May I? Sure. Uh, thank you again for your lecture. It was great. Uh, I work for a nonprofit and we deal with technology. We take technology to vulnerable, socially vulnerable youth. And one of the main challenges that we find is among themselves, they have a resistance. They feel like they don't have some sort of basis that is strong enough in order for them to deal with technology. They feel like they have to first grasp traditional concepts and I have this resistance from both students and educators so then they can go to technology they can work with technology so what how do you think we could deal with this resistance so it's a it's a common uh, fact it's less we I must say that I haven't seen it with the students but I've seen it a lot with the teacher there is the concept of if it's a serious teaching I need to lecture on the board and if it's game, it's probably not important uh, enough. There is a, a quote by an MIT professor that says that uh, playing is the highest level of uh, learning. Uh, but teachers not necessarily get that. What my company is doing, and again, we are not alone there, we try to work together with the existing uh, school uh, systems. So a typical scenario is half of the class is going to be a frontal discussion, and half of the class the kids are going to use the computers. Um, we provide teacher guides that allow uh, to do something very similar to the build exercise in a class uh, setting. And we hope that within a couple of years, we are going to become from this nice uh, additional resource, something that we're going to replace the core uh, teaching. But it's a, it's required patient and strong uh, belief in, uh, in what you're doing. Thank you. There was a gentleman over here. Okay. So I think that time is out. Time is out? OK, time is out. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to speak with you after the presentation.